Now, we want to use these elementary matrices to prove this theorem about inverses, so it behooves us to find the inverses of these elementary matrices. So that's the next lemma we're going to prove. E i j lambda is invertible with inverse e i j minus lambda and e i lambda is invertible with inverse e i 1 over lambda. So this is the the main reason why we required lambda to be non-zero for type 2 because we want to be able to divide by lambda. Okay so to, to prove the lemma we just need to multiply these two matrices together and check we got the identity and to save your mind from the litany of dots we had above. I'm just going to do this for two by two matrices because that illustrates everything. So um, one lambda zero one. This is E one two lambda two by two matrix times one minus lambda zero one is one minus lambda plus lambda zero 1. That is the identity matrix. So in this case E 1 2 lambda inverse is E 1 2 minus lambda. Uh, and this is E i oh, sorry E 1 lambda Let's try multiplying it by E1, 1 over lambda. We're going to get lambda 0, 0, 1, uh, 1 over lambda 0, 0, 1. The lambda and the 1 over lambda give us 1. And the 1 and the 1 give us a 1. And everything else is 0. Great. OK. So it's really just a computation uh, best illustrated in the 2x2 two two case. So we want to use these ideas with elementary matrices to prove the theorem we said last time, which just to remind you said uh, if A is a matrix and you put a bar identity, this augmented matrix with an n by n identity on the right hand side of the bar into reduced echelon form. Meaning that you put everything to the left of the bar into the reduced echelon form. You, you perform the row operations to both sides but you stop when the left hand side is in reduced echelon form. Um, and you get, um, let's say, B, C, then A is invertible if and only if uh, B is the identity, and if B is the identity, then C is A inverse. So you do these row operations, you convert this augmented matrix into something where B is in reduced echelon form. If B is the identity, then C is A inverse. So, we put A into reduced echelon form by performing row operations. And each row operation corresponds to um, you know, multiplying on the left by 
an elementary matrix. Therefore, there's a whole sequence of elementary matrices uh, such that B uh, equals M, K, M, K minus 1. These, these M's are the elementary matrices times M1 times A. Okay, so M1 does the first row operation, M2 does the second, MK does the last one, and B is finally in reduced echelon form. So B has this form for some sequence of elementary matrices. M, I. Now, we're simultaneously performing the same row operations on both sides of this bar, so that tells us C is also M, K down to M, 1 times the identity. So C is actually just a product of elementary matrices. And comparing this expression here, M1 up to uh, MK up to M1, with this expression here, we see that B equals C A. Right? This expression B equals MK up to M1 A, that MK up to M1 is is just called C, right? That's what this expression is saying. So if B is the identity, then the identity equals C A, so C equals A inverse. So, and in this case, A is definitely invertible. Because we've just said what its inverse is. Okay, so that proves that this actually does give you the right answer when A is invertible. We still need to check, however, that when A is not invertible, then B is not the identity, right? That's what if and only if means, right? What we've shown is if B is the identity, then A is invertible and C is A inverse. We also want to show that if B is not the identity, then A is not invertible. If B is not the identity, it's nonetheless a square matrix in reduced echelon form. And that means a row, at least one row, of B must vanish, it must be zero. Okay, because somehow if, if all the rows were non-zero, then there would have to be something non-zero on all the diagonal entries, and you're only allowed leading entries to be equal to 1. So it would have to be the identity matrix. So what does that mean? That means there has to be a free variable in the solution of BV equals 0. And remember this is equivalent to solving AV equals 0 by performing row operations. So in other words, there is at least one non-trivial solution to this equation. So there exists a V not equal to 0 such that AV uh, equals 0. But then A can't be invertible so if A were invertible, then V would be A inverse 0, but that would be 0. And that contradicts the fact that V is not 0. Right, so the point here is that because there's a free variable, there's like a whole line's worth of solutions, at least, right, not just a single point. Okay, so this shows 
this bit shows that if B is not the identity, then A is not invertible. A really nice corollary of this is uh, the following. So a product of elementary matrices is invertible and conversely and this is the nice bit any invertible matrix is a product of elementary matrices So the one direction is relatively easy. If you have a product of elementary matrices, mk up to m1, then its inverse is just m1 inverse up to mk inverse by the lemma we proved a little while ago using the formulae for the inverses of elementary matrices that we proved earlier in this lecture. And the other direction follows from the proof we've just given. You know, if A is an invertible matrix, then its inverse is this matrix C, which is a product of elementary matrices. So this follows from the proof we just saw. Anyway, this shows you, this justifies why our method for computing inverses works. Okay, in the next video, we're going to take a slightly deeper look at when a matrix is invertible and what is the analogue of this condition that we had for 2 by 2 matrices that AD minus BC is not equal to 0.